water. They knew water was melting the ice, but it appears that it's prying the ice apart like a powerful lever. You can hear melt water running right now and it's all getting stuck in the glacier. And if you have a fracture with high pressure water and it, it can ratchet the, the crack open. The seismic record confirms that the calving events have the unique signatures of fractures caused by water. As rising temperatures create more surface melt, the water pours into the cracks in the glacier and wedges it apart. The result is increased calving and a quicker demise of the glacier. Oh, there's a big one coming up from underneath. There it is. Balog is seeing this powerful fracturing effect firsthand as the fjord below comes alive. That basal ice has come up from the very bottom of the glacier, that, that dark blue out there. As the ice and the snow are squeezed together, the air gets driven out of it. And so the color becomes more and more pure. The air bubbles are what make it white. And so when the base of the glacier breaks up, you get these fantastic sapphires and turquoises boiling up out of nowhere, you know, and that's what these bergs are. Meanwhile, after several days of laser tracking, Tad Pfeffer knows how fast the Columbia is moving. 50 feet per day, eight times faster than it was 30 years ago. Go back to 1980. Here on this bedrock, we had ice above us 1,500 feet. Look at the trim line over there. That's where the ice surface was in 1980. And all of that volume is lost because this calving is so fast and snowfall upstream isn't resupplying it. So in that sense, yeah, it's going too fast and the glacier is kind of collapsing. Pfeffer suspects that the Columbia is long past its tipping point and it's only a matter of time before it withers away entirely. This kind of ice is called dead ice. It's no longer part of the living active glacier. It's stranded up on the side of the ice stream and it's melting away and collapsing. And as it does that, all the erosional debris that's on the top continues to concentrate until you have this ice covered in blackness. I'm really interested in the mortality of the glacier right here. There's something very rich and very intense about the, the changing landscape. You know, I feel the, the, the end, I feel the death right here. The problem is, it's not just the Columbia that's on its way out. Glaciers everywhere across the Rockies, Andes, Alps, and Himalayas are in their death throes. The people that live near the mountains and watch the glaciers know that the world is changing. We are heading towards Glacier National Park without any glaciers. We're seeing, you know, huge changes in Glacier Bay in Alaska and other places. If you go, if you look, you see it. The consensus is that in the next 50 to 100 years, mountain glaciers almost everywhere will simply disappear. From the loss of mountain glaciers alone, sea levels will rise by almost a foot, displacing millions of people around the world. But the biggest cost will be the loss of these huge natural reservoirs of fresh water water that one-sixth of the world's population depends on. The hardest hit will be in Asia, 
where nearly a billion people get their drinking water from Himalayan glaciers. The abrupt collapse of the world's mountain glaciers raises even more disturbing questions about the Earth's biggest tracts of ice, the polar ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. The real wild cards are what the big ice sheets are going to do. We're already seeing the Greenland ice sheet start to behave in rather disturbing ways. We're playing with fire, if you will, when it comes to the ice sheets. We don't know whether if we get these big, massive freight train-like beasts going, whether we can stop them. The potential for the polar ice sheets to flood the planet is staggering. If all of Greenland and Antarctica were to melt, the oceans would rise 200 feet. But over geologic time, these ancient bulwarks of ice have withstood many bouts with climate warming. Until a few years ago, scientists thought the ice sheets were simply too big and too dense to be an immediate risk but the latest evidence is making them rethink. The first wake-up call came from the West Antarctic Peninsula. In the summer of 2002, a NASA satellite photographed a Rhode Island-sized slab of ice called Larsen B as it sheared off the ice shelf. Other collapses followed turning the assumption that it would take thousands of years for the big ice sheets to melt on its head. The ice sheets surprised us. We sort of thought that the little glaciers would melt when it got warmer and that the big ice sheets wouldn't do much. And all of a sudden, the big ice sheets started rumbling faster and the Larsen B was falling apart. And we said, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. On the other side of the globe, Greenland's cache of ice is also showing signs that it's starting to feel the heat. In the last decade, temperatures here have shot up by about five degrees Fahrenheit. NASA satellites are already detecting a meltdown around the edges of the ice sheet. Global warming is hitting hardest in the Arctic, and all eyes are now fixed on Greenland's ice. Its next move could be the game changer for rising sea levels. In the heart of Greenland, Baylog and scientists encounter an entirely different realm. A single slab of ice about 1,500 miles long and 500 miles wide. It's mid-July, and the summer melt on the Greenland ice sheet is in full swing. It's sort of like a ice version of Kansas out here. It feels like you're out in the Great Plains and it just happens to be white and there's this vast dome in the sky overhead. It's, it's unbelievable. There's no sound at all, no sound except the wind and the water. It looks quite featureless when you just look horizontally. But as you walk over it and you look down on it, there's, there's a tremendous amount of texture and detail in here. This entire surface is like one gigantic Swiss cheese. During the melt season, the sun's heat transforms the surface of the ice creating a landscape that constantly shifts between solid, liquid, and vapor. The meltwater courses through the ice sheet, searching for a path down. Figuring out how this complex plumbing works is essential for predicting the future of the ice sheet. Whoa, that 
is intense. Oh my God. I can see, I think maybe 250 feet down into the dark. No sign of the bottom. But this water is just drilling down into the ice sheet. There's this great unknown here. This great mystery of where does all this water go? And what does it do to the flowing and the melting of the ice sheet and sending it out to sea? Nobody really knows. Baylog wants to get a shot that delves deep into the underbelly of the ice. The only way to secure his ropes is to thread them through the ice sheet. You know, this ice sheet is cooking down and melting a lot, so this whole top foot and a half where you would normally put an ice screw is rotten and, and loose. Whereas here, we're actually using the ice sheet itself and the strength of the ice to anchor the ropes. So here we go. All right, a little slack. Okay. Wow. Yay. How about that? These giant holes, called moulons, are thought to bore thousands of feet through the ice to the bedrock. But nobody has ever been down there to find out. Oh, God. That's the first time I've really seen the hole down there. Dave, this whole balcony could go any second. There it goes! It's a strange, evil, gorgeous, horrible, fantastic place. I mean, there's hundreds of years of ice here layered in, and we're looking into the cross section of this life history of the glacier. And it's so beautiful, this insane aquamarine and all this scalloping and fluting from the water. What a spot. Baylog is just scratching below the surface of the ice sheet. Below him is another half mile of solid ice. In these compressed layers of the ice sheet, there are clues to how fast Greenland could melt. At the National Ice Core Lab in Lakewood, Colorado, a giant freezer stores over 45,000 feet of ice drilled from 34 sites around the cryosphere. Dating back hundreds of thousands of years, these ice cores are time capsules that allow scientists like Jim White to peer deep into the history of ice. This piece of ice is interesting because it has a couple of things you can see right away. One is there are bubbles throughout here. These bubbles are little packets of air. It's these bubbles we can take out and measure CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide. It's the only medium that really collects the atmosphere itself. The other thing you can see in here quite clearly is you can see the layers. And the thickness is going to tell you how much snow fell that year. So you get a couple of pieces of climate information and a dating scale just out of visually looking at this ice core. Most importantly, scientists have identified a direct historical link between increases in greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and steep rises in global temperatures. At every peak, big rises in sea level followed as Greenland's ice sheet shrank. The ice core records also reveal a particularly telling moment in Greenland's history. Roughly 125,000 years ago, temperatures rose by about seven degrees Fahrenheit. The entire southern portion of the ice sheet melted and global sea levels rose by over 10 feet. It was caused by a change in the Earth's orbit around the sun, which increased temperatures and released carbon dioxide from the oceans. The more recent ice core record shows the potential for a similar meltdown. Right now, 
Greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere are even higher than they were 125,000 years ago. Higher than they've ever been in the last half million years.